Now let's take a look at problem 7 part 1, which states, for any natural number n, let p of n denote the proposition that for all i in the natural numbers, i less than n implies that for all j in the natural numbers, j is either equal to n, or n is not equal to i times j. And we wish to figure out for which natural numbers n, p of n is true. Now I'm going to start out by answering actually a slightly different question, which is, for which natural numbers is p of n false? This turns out to be a little bit easier to think about, and then we can just say that for all other natural numbers, p of n is true. So let's get started with p of n is false. So we know that p of n is false if not the statement p of n is true. This is equivalent to there exists some i in n such that and let's just, for simplicity, call this Q of n and i. So this is not Q of n, i. And this is just using the standard rules of how to negate with quantifiers. So we know that P of n will be false if we can find an i for which Q of n, i is false. Then we can look at when Q of n, i is false when i is less than n, but this other piece, which we will just call r of n i, is false. And this is just because of what we know about implications. We know that implications are false if the first part, the p part, is true, but the second part, the q part, is false. So this is just straight from the definition of uh, true and false, or the truth table for uh, implications. So q of n i is false when i is less than n, but r of n i is false. So when is r of n i false? r of n i is false when we have not uh, for all j and then everything else, which I'm not going to copy down here, which is equivalent to there exists a j in the natural numbers such that, uh, and let's call this portion right here, s of n i j. And I'm just naming all of these things because it can be, one, really long to write all of them out, and two, kind of complicated if you have to think about doing everything all at once. I'm a big fan of doing things in steps, so we're just doing things in steps. So R of n i is false if there exists a j in n such that not s n i j. So what is this not s n i j? Well, we know De Morgan's law. which tells us that not A or B is logically equivalent to not A and not B. And you can just verify this uh, really quickly by writing out the truth table for both of these expressions. Um, but it was also covered in, I believe, discussion one. So we know from this that not S of N, I, J is going to be not A, so J not equal to n and not b, so n equals i j. So altogether, we know that p of n is false when there exists an i such that i is less than n, but there exists a j such that j is not equal to n, and n equals i times j. So let's decipher this from the inside out. 
this part here means that j divides n, since i is also a natural number, but j is not n. What that means for the outside here is that i also divides n, because we have to have n equals i times j. I'll just make that an equal sign, a bit more, bit more obvious there. So i divides n, but is not n. And this is because we know that i has to be strictly less than n. And is not 1. And we know that it cannot be 1, because we know that j cannot cannot be n. So, p of n is false when there exists an i and a j such that i and j divide n and are not 1 and not n, which means that p will be true for prime numbers or, since they do not have any divisor except 1 in themselves, it's also true for n equals 1 because we restrict that i is less than n, 0 does not divide 1, and so the proposition actually only has one case. And also for n equals 0, since uh, it's just vacuously true, because we can't find a natural number less than 0. So to recap, p of n is true for prime numbers. also for n equals 0 and n equals 1. Now let's take a look at problem 7.2, which looks really messy to begin with. So let's just start out by rewriting it without the periods and with parentheses instead. And I'm going to leave out the um, in n portion for each of these variables, mostly just to save on writing. It's good practice to leave it in, um, but it's also enough to state it at the beginning of the problem. So we have not for all i open parenthesis, not, there exists a j, open parenthesis, there exists a k, open parenthesis, not for all l, open parenthesis, f of i, j, not equal g of k, l. Okay, now we have a bunch of parentheses to close, and three more it looks like, one, two, three. So let's take this in pieces. So we have not for all i. What happens here is the not hits the for all, and it turns into there exists an i. Then it hits the parenthesis and stops. So now we have a not. And then all of this stuff goes in here. And I just don't want to rewrite it all out again. You should for your homework solutions, but I'm going to take a shortcut here. So. We have there exists an i such that not, not there exists a j, and more stuff in here. This not hits this not, and they cancel out. So now we actually have there exists an i, there exists a j, such that all of this other stuff. So there exists an i, there exists a j. There exists a k. We don't have to do anything about that one because there's no negation. And I'm just copying this part down now. And now we have not for all l. And then this expression goes here. So again, the not hits the for all and turns it into there exists an l such that not the stuff in parentheses. Which means that it's actually there exists an L such that f of i j equals g of k L because that's the negation of not equals. And we copy all this stuff down as well. I was just leaving it out for brevity. So altogether we have there exists an i in n, there exists a j in n, there exists a k in n, and there exists an L in n, such that f of i comma j 
is equal to g of k comma l. So really the important thing to realize here is that uh, negatives fly through quantifiers and flip them between for all and there exists. And then as soon as they hit a parenthesis or a period, depending on your notation, they stop. And then you have to apply them to everything inside. 